I'm just in love with all these three. The Weald and the Marsh and the Down Country. Nor I don't know which I love the most, the Weald or the Marsh or the White Chalk Coast. <laughs> of time, like all things mortal, has passed Rudyard Kipling of immortal fame. How is it possible to compress into a short newsreel tribute the story of the great storyteller? Generations whom he inspired were eager to know him, but it was only seldom that he allowed himself the limelight, as on one rare occasion with his cousin Stanley Baldwin at St Andrews. Such fame was Kipling's in the zenith of his life that his later years, by contrast, has seemed to display a declining glory, but the future will rectify this injustice. In his mastery of the short story unique, in his poetry, how he framed his countrymen's thoughts of patriotism. Whether he wrote of India in those early days of his career, or of the jungle with its tales for children as well as grown-ups, or of Tommy Atkins in his trials in the Boer War, or of the Navy in the Great War during which his son was killed, there was and can only be one Kipling. And as long as the British Empire survives, indeed as long as the British Empire is remembered and the English language is spoken, Kipling will be honoured and quoted as the scribe and poet of the British Empire. At the end of the last century, Rudyard Kipling was assured of the esteem of the British public. The writing which had chronicled the British Empire, championed the ordinary soldier, and reflected a life of adventure across the red-painted globe. God of our fathers, known of old, Lord of our far-flung battle line, beneath whose awful hand we hold dominion over palm and pine. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. Of course, his work um, uh, uh, up to this time had been very largely Indian, Indian stories, plain tales from the hills, soldiers three, uh, Indian poetry, poetry actually about India, and of course the soldiers' poetry, which really, I think, made his name. There was a change when he came into Sussex because the second half of his life, he wrote what I think was his best work. His poem, The Land, is one of the best, I think, ever written about Sussex, or Sussex people. And then he wrote several stories about them, and, of course, he wrote Pack of Pooks Hill and Rewards and Fairies, which are really history books uh, written by fairies. And these uh, made a tremendous impact because he always established the groundwork, the frame, if you like, for his picture, and then painted the picture in it. You have, in most of his stories, you have parts of Sussex which we all know. Kipling came to Sussex, to the coastal village of Rotting Dean near Brighton, where his aunt and uncle, the painter Edward Burns Jones, had a summer home. He rented a house called the Elms across the village green and set up home in what he affectionately called the family square. It seemed like home for a restless soul. Then there grew up great happiness between the Dean, North End House and the Elms. One could throw a cricket ball from any one house to the other. But beyond turning out at 2am to help a silly foxhound puppy who had stuck in a drain, I do not remember any alarms and excursions other than packing farm carts filled with mixed babies, Stanley Baldwin's and ours, and dispatching them into the safe, clean heart of the motherly downs for jam-smeared picnics. The Kipling family were extremely happy because they could enjoy the beach, he could fish off the pier, they, the children could explore the rock pools in the, on the shore, and so it was a very happy existence indeed. People came out uh, from Brighton especially to see him, 
And on one occasion, there's rather a nice uh, record of his being asked by some trippers the way to the elms. And he pointed out uh, the directions that they needed, but didn't let on the fact that they were talking to the owner of them, the elms himself. And there's another story, which is really quite charming, of the way in which the local horse bus, which brought out trippers from Brighton, so that they could peer over the high wall of the elms into the privacy of the Kiplings, drove very close to the wall itself and broke off one of the overhanging branches. This infuriated Kipling enormously, and so he wrote a very strong letter to the landlord of the White Horse complaining of this act, and the landlord showed the letter to his cronies in the bar parlour that evening, and they counselled that he should do, take no action at all. But one member of the uh, group realised that there was a value to this autograph letter and so offered the landlord ten shillings for it, which he accepted. He didn't reply to Kipling, and so the next day Kipling sent down an, a doubly vehement letter to the landlord complaining of the action of the bus driver. And again, there was no action, but this time the letter received a pound he still didn't respond to Kipling, and so on the third day, Kipling came storming into the bar to demand an explanation for the uh, behaviour of the, of the landlord in not responding. And the landlord's response was devastatingly simple. He said, why, sir, I was hoping as you'd send me a fresh one every day. They pay a deal better than bus driving. And so, of course, there was no answer, and I think Kipling saw the, the joke and went off quite happy and, and all was forgotten and forgiven. Whatever the strength of his controversial opinions, Kipling always had time for his children, Josephine, John and Elsie. He was especially close to his eldest daughter, Josephine. It was, however, not all domestic bliss. He still travelled widely. His wife, Carrie, was American-born and the family spent many winters in South Africa. But the 1899 voyage to New York very nearly cost Kipling his own life through pneumonia. Tragically, it did kill Josephine. He was totally devastated by the death of Josephine. He kept seeing her in imagination in the garden in which he played so happily. And really, he could never come to terms with Rotting Dean again in the same way that he had before. And indeed, his own daughter, Elsie, said that a light has gone out which could never be rekindled. Poor Rudy. He saw her when a door was opened, when a space was vacant at table, coming out of every green, dark corner of the garden, radiant and heartbreaking. you and me and going truly exploring and not being in till tea here's your boots i bought them and here's your cap and stick and here's your pipe and tobacco i come along out of it quick it was in part kipling's fascination with new technology that pulled him out of it Bull. Summer day, a friend cried for war. His arms with us brought one of those motor things. It was a 20 minute trip. Turned Armed roam beyond the dance. No tender hearted garden crowns, no bosomed woods adorn our blunt, bow headed, wailed back down. 
but gnarled and riven on. Bare slopes where chasing shadows skim, and through the gaps revealed, belt upon belt, the wooded, dim, blue goodness of the weald. It was to the weald that Kipling now turned to find the home in the depth of the countryside that was providing such rich inspiration. He used the carp to find a new home. He was unhappy in Rotting Dean after the death of Josephine. He uh, also had the arguments with villagers over the, uh, their lack of patriotism. And um, so he wanted to find somewhere different. And he motored all over Sussex. And on one occasion, he was driving only 100 yards from the Elms when an American car he had broke down. He said to his wife, Carrie, my dear, American girls are the best in the world, but American cars, damn them. The house hunting expeditions continued under Kipling's resolute leadership for over two years. The whiff of exploration was enough to fuel a vivid imagination. We left Rottingdean because Rottingdean was getting too populated. Then we discovered England, which we had never done before, and went to live in it. England is a wonderful land. It is the most marvellous of all foreign countries that I've ever been in. It is made up of trees and green fields and mud and the gentry. And at last, I'm one with the gentry. The county flowed beneath our wheels. The snapping forward of a lever. Green cuttings brim full of liquid sunshine. They wanted a house where they could be peaceful and quiet after the noise and, and the turmoil of the house at Rottingdean. He had a desire to own land, to be a landowner. And, of course, he started with 33 acres at Batemans and finished up with 305. He bought every field that he could lay his hands on. He saw the very own house. We must make an honest woman of her as quickly as we can. Behold us, lawful owners of a grey stone lichened house, A.D. 1634 over the door, beamed, panelled, with old oak staircase, and all untouched and unfaked. Kipling had at last found a place in which to put down roots. But Bateman's became much more. It was a creative focus for his work. Everything around him, the earth and flowers, had a power. These shall cleanse and purify, webbed and inward turning eye. These shall show thee treasures hid, thy familiar fields amid, and reveal, which is thy need, every man a king indeed. In a secluded corner of the house, Kipling would work within the sober, self-contained elegance of his study, surrounded by the trappings of a lifetime's travel. Men and women may sometimes, after great effort, achieve a creditable lie. But the house, which is their temple, cannot say anything, save the truth of those who have lived in it. When he was completely absorbed in a, in a poem or a story, uh, he said that he was hatching. And when he was hatching, he was a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. And it was only then uh, that he was completely unapproachable. He wrote freely, using pen and ink, of course, and that pewter ink pot in his study, which has all the titles of stories scratched on it. 
And when he'd finished the story, he'd put it away to drain, as he called it. Uh, and after some few weeks, he would take it out and go through with a, a paintbrush and a, a bottle of Indian ink or Chinese ink. And he would blot out, like a censor did, all those things which he didn't like. He was always a man who was completely lost in his work. You'll find that people in Burwash said that they, uh, sometimes he would speak to them and sometimes he didn't. He didn't speak to them because he was busy thinking a chapter of a story or working on a verse, and he'd walk along with his head down thinking over these things, and if people said, good morning, Mr Kipling, he just didn't answer because he wasn't there. Daughter Elsie later commented on this state of mind. If he was really busy with a piece of work, he was utterly absorbed in it and quite oblivious to anything else. Thus, his children learned very early to keep any requests or plans until he had safely finished whatever was engaging him, until he came back, as they called it, and was again ready to enter their daily life. When their father did come back, he enjoyed indulging their games and adventures. John and Elsie were to become the models for the characters of Dan and Una, who feature as guides through the stories contained in Kipling's next two books, Puck of Poop's Hill and Rewards and Fairies. That day, they intended to discover the North Cape, like Othea, the old sea captain, in the book of verses which Una had brought with her. But on account of the heat, they changed it to a voyage up the Amazon and the sources of the Nile. Even on the shaded water, the air was hot and heavy with drowsy scents. Dragonflies, wheeling and clashing, were the only things at work, except the moorhens and a big red admiral who flapped down out of the sunshine for a drink. Kipling had a growing interest in myths and magic, partly perhaps as a balm for the lingering sadness about Josephine, but also in response to the sense of the timelessness that rural life and the countryside gave him. If one scratched the rabbit-shaven turf, one came across the narrow mule tracks of peacock-hued furnace slag laid down in Elizabeth's day. The ghost of a road climbed up out of this dead arena and crossed our fields, where it was known as the gunway and popularly connected with our martyr times. Every foot of that little corner was alive with ghosts and shadows. Kipling never belonged to the community at Burwash in the way he might have liked. Country affairs were only interesting in their bearing on his work, and the villagers were suspicious of his American wife. It was Carrie who they saw most, as she managed the estate and hired the local labour. Albie Waterhouse spent two years as a gardener at Bateman's, but his views on the Kiplings are uncompromising. Well, it was all right working in the gardens of it when he didn't see Kipling or his wife. She was a tartar, she was. She was absolutely tartar. And she had a little window facing up the hill. And she see me ten minutes late one morning, seven o'clock, ten past seven. She had me in the office. And uh, she said, uh, what was, why was you late this morning? I said, my mother, I said, wouldn't let me come with eating breakfast. So that went on for two or three days. And then one day she caught me once and I had to go in the office and I, I had so much, so fed up with her, I went in the office and I said, well, madam, which bit of carpet I got to stand on? <laughs> she was a devil, she was. She didn't stand much more than four foot two. She used to wear the trousers. But she said I was the rudest man she'd ever had down there. I said, you know, you're the rudest bloody woman I've ever met. She was bossy. Uh, 
I don't think Rudyard Kipling minded this. He was quite prepared to be bossed about, provided he had comfort. He got it. He tended to pluck names out of the local community for use in his Tories. In a way, it's rather a nice tribute to those who were living in the village at the time to be immortalised in this way in some of the best love stories that we've got. I'm sure he did feel a kindred spirit with the local craftsmen because he was a craftsman with words. He realised that they were craftsmen with the tools that they had been trained to use or had learnt to use. And so he respected them for their job and I think they respected, them, respected him equally for, for his. His dead are in the churchyard, 30 generations laid. Their names were old in history when Doomsday Book was made. And the passion and the piety and the prowess of his line have seeded, rooted, fruited in some land the law calls mine. There was more tragedy in Kipling's life when the First World War, which many had accused him of encouraging, cost him the life of his son. On still evenings, it was even possible to hear the rumble of distant shell fire from the hills around Batemans. Kipling's twilight years were spent there, often in melancholy. On the downs, in the weald, on the marshes, I heard the old God say, here come very many people. We must go away. They take our land to delight in, but their delight destroys. They flay the turf from the sheep walk. They load the deans with noise. Kipling, the private man, felt so much for his chosen home of Sussex. Yet, Ironically, for a man who had celebrated the pioneering spirit of early motoring, he became acutely aware of the fragile nature of his rustic paradise. In January 1936, he was taken ill while he was staying in Brown's Hotel in London on the way to Cannes, and he was rushed into the Middlesex Hospital. And a week later, having been operated on, he died. Uh, he died on the 18th of January, and only... Three days later, King George V died. And it was often said that the king is dead and he was preceded by his trumpeter because, of course, Kipling had been the poet of empire. There is something for everybody in what Kipling has written. I think nobody would, would claim to like everything that he wrote, but his variety was such that you can find something if you want it. And certainly in his own time, he was the greatest. And I think he would stand up with any of the other giants of English literature. Rudyard Kipling found more than a home in Sussex. He found here the understanding of a landscape and people which his work strives to convey. Sussex was very much the center of his world. And what should they know of England who only England knows?